So the uh, agenda today is uh, planning for tracker data use. So we'll be reviewing how our analysis and information needs affect program design. Um, as mentioned earlier, my name is Brian O'Donnell. I'm an implementation advisor for UIO. And I also advise the Norwegian Institute of Public Health on some of their tracker implementations in Palestine and Bangladesh. Um, so the outline for today's session, um, uh, tying in with our questions from earlier on the Mentimeter that we just had, um, but we'll be talking a bit about how to um, build our tracker systems so that they support better data use across the board. And often this means thinking quite early in the process of designing tracker about what the most important indicators are that we want as outputs from the tracker model, right? The, if the purpose of the tracker is to get more granular and routine data about uh, the individual level conditions of certain uh, patients or your, uh, your healthcare system, then you want to make sure that you're gathering all of the data that you actually need for that purpose at the very start of your design process. Um, next, we'll be thinking about the, um, the process for gathering your, gathering your indicator requirements. So who to involve and what to review with that process. And then we have a few use cases before wrapping up that we'll explore as discussed earlier. Um, Ghana will discuss um, their workshops for designing indicators across multiple programs of the Ghana Health Services. Um, Sri Lanka will talk a bit about um, COVID-19 analytics requirements and how they work those into the system design that we promote from his Sri Lanka. And then I'll, um, I'll wrap up with some research that was done with the um, MCH tracker in uh, West Bank, Palestine, comparing aggregate and tracker data um, a couple years ago and maybe discussing some of the, the reasons why that might be there. So um, yesterday and uh, in the initial day, we brought this concept of the tracker maturity model or the, the tracker house. And um, you can see here that there's a number of different things that um, uh, and you'll remember from Mike's presentation there are a number of different topics that should be considered um, when you're designing a tracker, but the focus of today's sessions will really be about the linkage between the very peak of the pyramid or data use with the design and configuration process. Um, we won't go into so much of the technical details about um, how to build a program indicator or how to build a dashboard, but really coming up with the requirements that you need um, to actually build uh, dashboards or uh, reports that suit your use case. So these are just a few of the key considerations not meant to be fully comprehensive. And the reason why we're, at, why we're mentioning this now is because um, often we see that um, there are upstream and downstream considerations for your tracker because you're intending to make this a sustained part of your health information systems in your country. So when you're first designing the, the, your, uh, your tracker system, you may um, have requirements in mind that you won't have when you actually start consuming those data and using them to make decisions. So initially, people are very eager to jump into the design process, uh, start prototyping, and then deploying it and scaling as rapidly as possible. But then when they come to the actual consumption of those data for their uh, research analyses or their um, data use workshops or their um, their, monthly, their monthly meetings in the, for an integrated health system, like their provincial integrated meetings, then they say, wait, why, don't, why can't we make DHIS2 indicators about something else that's also very important? Or, um, and there might be some certain design considerations with your tracker system that you need to have in mind at the very beginning of this process. That's why we are, um, that's why we are printing this workshop into the very beginning of this academy. Um, so what makes tracker analytics different? I think this is a very um, important step that um, people um, might not consider when they're first designing a system um, because um, how tracker um, produces figures is very different from what you may be used to with uh, traditional data sets and aggregate reporting. So first, when we talk about the patient's longitudinal record, this might be considered a new dimension for data analysis, or there are, there are many more variables that you could consider uh, with your analysis when you, are, um, uh, when you have a tracker system, right? So the patient's longitudinal record consists of the track density instance, an enrollment, and a, events, right? And each one of those different, um, different items has an event date associated with it, maybe also a due date, 
It has an org unit where it took place. And then it has a number of different data elements as well. And we can think about how we group those events and enrollments and tracked entity instances, and tracked entity instances together um, and how it fits within this traditional model that we have of the organization unit, the period, and the data dimension. So there's a number of different options that we have, but it also means that you really need to think early about what your indicators actually mean in the tracker sense. Um, secondly, and I think this part is um, just as often overlooked, is that you, you have far more end users uh, of a tracker system because you're entering individual level data. So you have many more people who are actually entering the data. This also means that you'll have more demands for data analysis. You'll have other end users who may want different types of data from tracker than you would be traditionally used to when you were um, doing an aggregate report from a facility. And so that also means that this is a golden opportunity to really reimagine data use across the program, right? Because you have more stakeholders that are involved in sort of uh, crafting and designing this process. You also have more opportunities to really ask some very detailed uh, questions that you might leave to a survey or some sort of ex post research analysis on a aggregate data set. And so um, it's really the, a, a good time when you're first designing a tracker system to step back and think about what each indicator that you're collecting means in clear terms, um, determine who is going to use it and when, and then what decisions would really be made based on that indicator. Right. So you can actually take a sort of step back before you go diving into your tracker system. We won't go into this um, so much today. This is more of a, um, a configuration academy topic, but there are certainly design considerations that you could confer with um, experts in this academy or in the COP or your, um, your own team about the feasibility of certain indicators within tracker design. Um, we'll just briefly touch on those topics today. Um, but at the very last process of this is you'll, after you have a list of all the different uh, indicators that you want to collect, is that you'll actually be prioritizing which indicators you want to see in your own implementation. And then this will um, in turn inform the design process and the uh, scale and rollout of your tracker. So um, in the first day, um, Mike mentioned some of the Key, uh, key concepts for the tracker data model, which I touched on earlier. You have your tracked entity instances or your enrollments, you have events, and then each one of these discrete events has a date, organization unit, program stage, and a TEI that are associated with it. If you group all of these together, then you have um, aggregate data, right? You have counts of the number of tracked entity instances, you have a count of the number of events, number of discrete org units that were involved, we might also consider uh, relationships to be a part of those uh, aggregates that you could include. Um, and so there's a lot that you can really work with here. And the problem that a lot of people have is thinking, okay, how do I get from this tracker data model into some of the advanced analyses that I've seen um, other countries have um, and some use cases or some of these um, digital data packages that um, UIO releases. How do I actually transform these, uh, this tracker data model into some actionable evidence for my program? Um, and so this does require a lot of thinking through, not just um, sort of the technicalities of, of um, configuring these indicators, but also about um, how the data might be interpreted by the end user and how it would help them on their job. So we see here, like there's, you can make some um, pie charts about um, the types of vaccines that were taken last month, about stock status. There's also some ways that you can do individual level um, indicators as well. So not um, aggregating up to the, um, the clinic or organization unit level, but just to an individual track density instance. Can you show me the, the Z scores for weight versus height for this, for this uh, child over the last six months? And that's now something that's possible with tracker analytics that you couldn't do before. So uh, really the first step in uh, thinking about your requirements assessment for tracker indicators is thinking about who is requesting the tracker data and where is the demand, right? And then thinking about who is actually going to be using the system in their day-to-day -day work and what are their key incentives. So um, typically what we think of with uh, tracker systems is it's a bit of a, a pyramid shape, no? So at the very top of the pyramid, you'll have your, um, 
your IT staff who are actually, or your Ministry of Health staff, who are actually designing the system, coming up with program indicators, annual reports, um, people who are designing program rules, et cetera. And then maybe you would have um, health information officers at the district level in the middle, but especially with Tracker, you, you're talking about thousands of end users potentially. I know in some cases in Bangladesh and Nigeria, we've had tens of thousands of people submitting event data, right? And so that means that you'll have a lot of people who are really invested in the system. The problem is that this, um, the people who are actually designing the system is very often the people who are working at the uh, ministry level and are in charge of the, the purse strings to decide the direction of the project, or they're people with the technical know-how to make certain assumptions about how the tracker should look. And sometimes this, this mismatch can cause problems because Either the, the workflow doesn't match how the end users would typically think a tracker should work, or the data outputs are not actually matching what they need um, to make decisions at a local level. Um, so here's uh, one example of this. As a health system manager, I know that it's essential for my HMIS to know the number of hospital deliveries per month and by, by method of delivery. Um, it would also be nice to know just for like administrative and staffing purposes, um, can you give me the number of uh, hospital deliveries by time of day? So if I know if I should be staffing the hospital at like um, at, at late hours or if um, certain hospitals are seeing um, a greater influx of cases. So that might be nice to have for them, but at the data entry level, the people who are actually entering the data in the facility, maybe they're not so interested in just the, the raw number of deliveries that they're having and tracking that over time. But what they need to know for their own job are the delivery risk factors that were observed at a patient's third trimester, and then maybe also getting some routine feedback on the percent of patients with, uh, that actually received their blood glucose test according to the national guidelines. That way they can actually improve the quality of the care that they are providing, and they are alerted to key risk factors that, um, that an individual patient might have. So often we see that these nice to have indicators are, end up being prioritized over the important data for frontline workers. And this is um, not just about um, you know, extending an olive branch to these frontline workers, but this is actually about including them in the process of designing the system so that um, they have the data that they need to, make, uh, to improve their job and that they also care about quality data that are being entered into the system. So this is a lot of text and I apologize, but really we can think about three different ways for, um, for designing a tracker system. There's the paper to screen approach, um, which is uh, you have a very limited budget or you have a very limited time scale. So you're essentially looking at just at the data that you need um, for it to create an, a replica of an aggregate report, right? Um, but this is often very um, difficult in the long term because it, uh, the data entry flow doesn't match uh, how the end users uh, typically work with an individual level record. Uh, there might be redundant or misleading questions uh, at the individual level, and the output indicators would just not be relevant for, um, for the, the key stakeholders. Um, if we go to the very right of this, some people would often then course correct and say that okay, we're going to try and get as, um, as much data that we think might be relevant as possible into the system. And then we can make an assessment later about um, which data we actually need for our, uh, our routine data analysis or some research. So in this case, they're really approaching Tracker more like a demographic survey or a longitudinal study. And this really overburdens the end users with data collection tasks that are not necessary, right? Also, as we discussed yesterday, there are additional privacy concerns that you might have with um, collecting too much data than is strictly needed for the purposes of data use. Um, so we can maybe try to find a balance here in a middle road with a user-centric approach that would actually encourage, we were actually encouraged to reach out to the end users and treat them as uh, true partners. Um, and this way, ask them about the types of data that they would like to see uh, a tracker deliver and also really that helps you narrow down the key questions that your health system has and avoid these um, unnecessary or invasive questions. Um, with a user-centric approach, um, you can really also um, instill within the, uh, the end users a sense of confidence in the system. Um, and 
with that confidence, they will then proceed to um, deliver higher quality data because they actually get something out of it. Um, so I want to proceed a bit more quickly now, but these are some examples of indicator source requirements that you have. So of course, the very baseline that you would start with would be your current aggregate reports. Here's just a, um, a disease surveillance form for, uh, for Uganda. Um, uh, they might be delivered on a weekly basis. So what is the frequency of these paper reports? What are the expected disaggregations are important to keep in mind? Like here you would see the disaggregations would be by age. Um, but also, you know, it's, it might be time to consider in the, the PRISM framework for health information systems, uh, an actual data quality assessment for your aggregate data, right? What is the relevance of the data of each data point? What's its uh, completeness, its timeliness? Is it actually uh, accurate? And each of those um, questions will help you uh, fill certain gaps in your aggregate uh, data system that could then be filled in with tracker if you really focus in on them. Um, you might also look at our um, M&E framework. So here's just a very, uh, a very basic uh, um, M&E framework for malaria control monitoring for, for Ghana. And here we see that um, there's a number of process indicators and output indicators, as well as outcome indicators. And each one of these might be something that you could consider for, um, for uh, deriving your tracker data, um, your, your tracker data indicators, right? So um, how, can we how can our M&E plan incorporate tracker data for the program is another thing that you need to keep in mind at these very early stages, right? So maybe there are certain indicators that you should be uh, monitoring routinely on a very frequent basis, like your process indicators, the number of uh, patients that are coming in on a daily or weekly basis, for example, and then which indicators should be monthly. Maybe there are some that we only need data for on like an annual basis. So maybe there are certain data that you don't need to see on a dashboard, but you can export the data from tracker and do an analysis outside the system. Um, if you're looking for other, other places uh, to get some ideas and brainstorming about the types of analyses that you could do with tracker data, um, I might recommend this, uh, the Global Fund's list of recommended analyses by program and administrative area. You can see here that there are a number of analyses that individual data would really, um, would really support. Um, and you might even be able to um, run these analyses on a more frequent basis than um, the traditional annual or semi-annual basis, right? So you could do um, TB and HIV testing linkages or uh, cascade analysis. You could do a survival analysis or a treatment cohort analysis for TB. Um, you could talk about um, uh, age disaggregated analysis for adolescent girls and young women programs. These are all things that you might um, think about how you could actually use tracker data to deliver these analysis on a more routine basis. Um, and um, one, one other thing that I think is a really um, a huge opportunity um, with tracker data um, are considering the quality of care indicators that you have for your program. Um, this is an example from uh, Bangladesh of uh, tetanus immunization. Um, so in Bangladesh, um, you, um, if you're not known to be vaccinated under over 15 years of age or have an unknown status, then um, during antenatal care, um, the first TT dose should be given by week 28 of gestational age and the second one by week 32. But you maybe, not, you maybe don't know from aggregate data, you know, are these TT doses actually being provided at the right gestational age week? Um, do most people actually get their second TT dose during pregnancy? Um, but with this ability to look at the individual patient's record, you now have this opportunity to really look at quality of care indicators that at every visit um, a patient has, they're receiving all of the care that national guidelines say they should be receiving at that visit. And that further, not just at that visit, but at subsequent visits, there's a follow-up action that's taken. Um, so I think that um, looking into your uh, national guidelines for clinical care might also be a place to look for your uh, indicators. Um, so um, here's like our, um, our last um, sort of brainstorming or thinking exercise before we, um, before we break into the case studies. Um, but 
you know, when you're sitting with the program staff and you start brainstorming about what data might be possible beyond uh, aggregate, there are a number of different types of analyses that, that could be done. And here's just a few sample indicators that you can start thinking about. Um, and nutrition, for example, you can think about um, the percent change for an individual infant in, in their weight since the previous visit. Know um, in an Android device if this, um, if this uh, infant has gained weight. Um, for an HIV system, you could use program indicators to do a cohort analysis of ART attrition. So then you're actually finding all patients who started ART, say, 12 months ago and analyzing them about their current status, you know, last month, right? Um, if an MCH program, you could um, provide data directly to uh, the CHWs about the number of um, postpartum care visits that they provided less than 14 days after delivery. So you can see if they're actually getting um, this um, frequent follow-up just after delivery. Um, with uh, malaria, and this is a, a use case for the relationships model of tracker, but you could actually see the number of uh, new cases that were linked per index case, and you can do some analysis um, around that with some sort of uh, clustering at the very local level. Um, and then TB, and by the way, today's quote of the day is TB case surveillance. Um, I'll, we'll, we'll keep this up for the next slide too, if, in case you miss it. But um, for TB, you might consider the median days between the clinic visit and the lab result by test type, right? So you might actually do a time to event analysis between uh, the routine clinical visit and then the lab result that um, should happen after that clinical visit, right? So you can actually see the performance of the lab in responding to a request for lab results. Um, so I have a, a short video here about um, this, this workshop that um, the Ghana Health Services did a, a couple years ago. And I really think it, it, illustrates, um, it illustrates quite well how you can get many different program staff together in a room to discuss the different uh, ways that Tracker might support their systems. So here you see HIV programs, TB programs, MCH all sort of sitting around their DHIS2 uh, systems and trying to understand how program indicators work um, so that they can uh, start incorporating them into their, uh, their monthly uh, analysis plans. Um, and one quote um, from, I think this might've been uh, Felix afterwards, who was the, um, he was a Ghana Health Services uh, leading this workshop, but that it's very important to ensure program officers give their support to the e-tracker system and it is more important that they are fully involved at the beginning of the program and continue the training provided for them, right? So he's uh, acknowledging that it's very important to get your program officers and the end users of your system involved with this uh, tracker system at very, very early stages so that they understand uh, what data are possible to gather with tracker and what types of indicators they want. Um, so with that, I think we have um, Oswald on the line who might um, be able to uh, share a screen and tell us. Hey. So, good morning. My name is Oswald. Uh, work with the Ghana Health Service and a member of Ghana's Institute Technical Team. So, just uh, a continuation of what uh, Brian has been presenting on the need to build capacity uh, across board as far as uh, implementation of tracker is concerned. Uh, for you to be successful, it's not just enough to deploy tracker and build the indicators, but you need the buy-in of all the stakeholders as I had mentioned in an earlier presentation when we started this academy. And one of the key uh, stakeholders as far as tracker implementation is concerned has to do with the program staff, that is technical people, MAE officers who are working at the program level, your TB program, HIV, malaria, and all the technical areas of your healthcare system. So it's critical for them to understand what you do and what uh, type of indicators that you generate on tracker. And so uh, in Ghana, uh, in the latter part of 2019, as part of our efforts, to make sure that we are at the same level with the programs for them to understand how the program indicators are generated and what uh, output they can get from the, our tracker implementation. It was uh, critical to have uh, 
capacity building session between uh, the DIMS2 technical team as well as the program uh, offices. Now, there were very key things we needed to achieve. One was to be able to allow us to build that working relationship and our trust levels from a technical point of view, view and also from the program area. Even though uh, a number of us from the technical team are from a public health background, it is always critical in developing program indicators to have these program officers who are really the people who define how the program will achieve its objectives, understand exactly what you are implementing, then they can make a proper use of it. They become part and parcel of the development of the indicators and they are able to relate better with it. So one of the key things we needed to achieve with that session was to build that relationship between us. And we were riding on the back of a, a TB surveillance tool we were developing and we used that as an opportunity and use that as a test case to, uh, while we built the tools, we were also building capacity alongside for the program officers in that regard. And also to have a common understanding on which data elements and which indicators to, treat, uh, to create. The uh, reality is that uh, even though Tracker may have uh, the ability and the capacity for you to create multiple indicators and data elements, uh, it is critical for efficiency to uh, really create what is needed. And you can only establish that when you have this engagement with the program officers who uh, do the MAE staff and go to the front and interact with service providers and all that. And then we also uh, use the session to build some program rules for the TB tracker program, which we were due to start implementing the following year, that was in 2020. Yeah. Now, uh, there were three key things we did during this capacity building session. The first one we did was to review the program rules and indicator concept for everybody to understand what goes into the program rules, which uh, in essence helps you to structure how your tracker program will flow so that uh, at each point in time, based on uh, data that is being entered on the system, certain uh, data elements that are not applicable get hidden, although that becomes necessary, get shown, and then also use them as validation processes to clean up uh, the data that you are, uh, you are capturing at the service provider level. And also uh, went through the indicator concept so that they understand clearly what it means when we say program indicator and then what an indicator is, uh, especially when we were moving from the background of uh, the aggregate system where the indicator concept works a little bit different from the tracker program indicator uh, perspective. Then we also went through using custom functions in the rules and uh, the program indicator creation as well. Then we had a conceptual discussion on the program rule and indicator evaluation in a priority setting so that uh, you are able to determine which program rule should take precedence over the other. Sometimes it is also critical not to overburden the system with a lot of program rule because that has an impact on performance. And so you have to uh, take that into consideration. So it's critical to have these program officers help you to really screen up the program rules that you are writing so that uh, especially when you uh, are implementing tracker and you have to deploy to facilities using the Android app, the more program rules you have in there, sometimes you have a bit of a lag and a slow uh, rendering of the Android app. So it's critical to only add programs that are really necessary and not everything that is in there. Now, uh, so for program rules, uh, as I've indicated, they simply provide uh, a way for producing dynamic behaviors in, the res in response to how users input the data onto the system, either for tracker or for event capture. Uh, as far as DHIS is concerned, the uh, two uh, systems is critical for us to introduce these program rules to structure the system. 
Another critical thing that it does is to allow you to create and control how the user interface in the tracker behaves as far as uh, events and data tracker capture is concerned. And also during data entry, the rule expressions are able to be evaluated uh, each time the user uh, interface is displayed and each time a data element is changed. Then we talked of the program indicators, which allow us to create uh, values based on the data elements or attributes. Remember that the tracker system is a transactional uh, uh, system that virtually captures just attributes and data elements of each client. So program indicators essentially helps us to be able to generate aggregate values from these individual transactional data that are inputted during service provision. And essentially we can then uh, uh, build that as indicators and if we so desire, we can uh, transmit that into data sets and eventually uh, get aggregate reporting system. And for us, that is the key thing as far as a uh, tracker and deployment is concerned. It then reduces and helps you achieve the overall aim, aim of not getting so many errors with regards to collation of data and then data entry. Because once you are able to have very good program indicators, you are able to convert them into data and put them on data set. So as transactional data are captured directly, the aggregate data to is being produced and it becomes a lot more efficient. So basically those were the things we went through, went through quite a number of examples. And by the time we finished, it was a week long uh, uh, session. By the time we finished with the help of the program officers, we had created almost all the program indicators that we needed as far as the TV surveillance system was concerned. And for us, it was uh, successful in the sense that this time around, it wasn't just the technical team that was creating these program indicators. We also had the program officers understanding what went into the program indicators and helping in creating them. So that if we were defining logics in these uh, program indicators that did not meet the objectives of the program, our attention was drawn and then together we uh, discuss and structure in a manner that is uh, more efficient for us to be able to deliver the program indicator. So basically this was what we did. And uh, since then it has helped us as far as our implementation of uh, tracker in Ghana is concerned. Thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, in the next 10 to 15 minutes, what I hope to discuss is uh, how we consider the analysis and information needs uh, when we design tracker programs, uh, especially with the experience we had uh, with regard to information requirements around COVID-19. So um, Sri Lanka was, in fact, one of the first countries, in fact, the first country start, who started using DHS2 for COVID-19 surveillance. So. Uh, what you see here, especially on your left side, are the components that we designed in our EHS 2 based system uh, for COVID-19 information requirements. So you can see like there are a lot of components, uh, but what I want to highlight is most of these components are based on tracking. So for example, ports of entry, quarantine, hospital, community response, ICU bed tracking. I mean, almost all except a few logistics monitoring, which is on aggregate. And then uh, this year, we uh, launched this large scale immunization module, which is also in uh, DHIS2, and it's a large scale uh, tracker implementation. So, overall, we had a lot of uh, tracker related experiences as well as mostly challenges uh, when implementing it in the last uh, one and a half years. So, what I hope to discuss uh, is I will be uh, taking around four examples of different modules and how we considered. Uh, the analysis and information requirements and how that uh, the, these requirements affected when we were designing the tracker program. So few general concerns. Now, only thing which is certain about this COVID-19 is the uncertainty of requirements and the uncertainty of COVID. So requirements keep on changing. So you really need to have a very open mind when you are, uh, when you are trying to configure your tracker program. So you definitely have to expect in this kind of situation to have multiple tracker programs. So as you can see here, as of now, our uh, system has uh, like 18 tracker programs that we are using for different uh, information requirements. 
And then when you are talking about this many programs, it is very crucial that you have your metadata clean because like you are talking about a couple of, a couple of hundreds of metadata only for this tracker program. So it is very important that you follow these best practices of uh, naming conventions uh, that we usually learn in design and customization of DHS2. And then uh, the other thing that, that we realized is like we have to reuse the same track entity type so as you can see here, uh, down here, so we have attributes, and then we also have something called tracked entity attributes. We have a separate thing called program attributes. So the difference is that if you use uh, an attribute as a tracked entity attributes, irrespective of which program you're going to use, it is going to be displayed, right? And you can search using this attribute. So, so one thing that we kept in mind in general is to have a minimal number of track entity attributes. And if requires, we had more program attributes so that uh, we just keep this, uh, uh, the, the access controls and uh, that uh, the, the, the granular control of access to data uh, at program level. And then of course, uh, one other thing we might not realize because if you are too much DHS to oriented is that for end users, most of the time, they expect analysis and data capture together. Even for us, it's mostly analysis separate, capture separate. But for end users, it's very difficult to convince that uh, these are two different things, when, at least when you're configuring in DHS2. So we had to uh, address this also at uh, certain instances. Right, so I will be talking about a couple of use cases. The first one is about contact mapping. So the broader requirement was to uh, visualize the chain of transmission from a suspect to case. So from which one to which person the COVID-19 was transmitted. So it's a kind of like you can visualize a map kind of thing with the people or truck entity instances connected that we wanted. So the challenges, the first of all, we did not have a proper visualization support uh, DHIS2 uh, uh, with the built-in, the default application. So like data or event visualizer, we could not do that. And then we also had to consider about how to uh, adapt the tracker model. Right. Uh, we have to decide, like we have cases and suspects, so whether we are going to uh, configure them as track entity instances, or are these going to be two separate programs for cases and uh, suspects. So this decision we had to take. And then of course, like if you are talking about two different track entity instances, how are you going to link them up? Right. So one uh, option that was um, quite straightforward was to use relationships. And then if that is the case, are we using it in a single direction or bi-direction? How are we going to do it? And, and then, of course, if you use relationships, how are you going to visualize uh, with existing DHS2 tools that are available? And then we also had this issue, like, for example, we know like we have attributes and data elements. But in case if you are going to filter right, in, a, in, a, in a front page list or something, are you going to use them as attributes or data elements? If it is data elements, then uh, the filtering part is going to be a bit tricky. So these are the main issues that we had. And we finally decided that uh, the best way we can achieve the flexibility was to design a custom application, right? So this is the initial version of the application that we designed based on, based on these concepts that we had in mind. So this, this kind of visualized from which uh, track entity instance to which uh, one it was transmitted, right? And we also try to demarcate whether it's gender, the, the, based on the domain requirements. So they wanted to have been this uh, visualization itself to identify whether it's a male or female. Uh, and of course, uh, whether it's a case or suspect, right? So those were, uh, I mean, those are the basic requirements we initially had. So with this, we designed something for Sri Lanka. And we also found that it's a kind of a generic requirements that was there in, uh, uh, across a few other countries as well. So this was when with the help of uh, DHS to core team in University of Oslo, uh, our team tried to make a generic application for contact mapping visualization, which is, uh, how, I mean, so what you're seeing now is the kind of a, uh, visualization that you get with this generic app, which is available in the DHIS2 uh, app hub. But even with this app, we had a lot of challenges and issues that mainly we observe, uh, we obtained from the feedback from the end users. So I'm not going to go through all the challenges, but you can see. So one major challenges like what if you get this kind of a visualization right you are talking about uh, now in this at least i'm seeing a couple of thousands of track entity instances so we were processing all these in the browser we download everything right because we could not filter it based on a period and the relationship so we had to download everything and display it in the browser so if we are talking about very large number of people uh, the cases 
um, like uh, how it, how the how is going to be the performance when when you are using it in a uh, web browser was kind of quite uh, questionable. So for this, we have obtained some feedback from uh, uh, different uh, stakeholders, and this is what we are trying to do now, so that. We try to incorporate one thing is this longitudinal uh, aspect of tracker uh, visualization. Like, like uh, say for example, in, in COVID, we are mainly considered about 10 to 14 days. So this we are trying to take into consideration here in this new design. And then of course, rather than displaying everyone, I mean, all the patients uh, at one go, we try to just select one and try to drill down to multiple levels. So these are some design uh, uh, considerations that we are doing right now for this visualization. Uh, but like only thing, uh, we have to go back and uh, think like how we uh, customize the tracker, tracker uh, basically the tracker data model, how we used it to support this uh, visualization. So there are some limitations in the platform as well, which we have, uh, have to find answers. Right, uh, then of course, the next uh, requirement that we had was uh, something very unique. So we have this PCR testing, which is done in the community, and we have the PCR testing laboratories in institutes, right? So the, the requirement was like they want a very transparent mechanism to see like uh, for the community people as well as the laboratory people, the status of the laboratory sample. So one major challenge that we had was like uh, they wanted a kind of a custom working list uh, and the visualization uh, when the community person logs in, he should see only his areas uh, cases that he has sent to laboratory. And the laboratory, uh, he should, uh, the person should only see the uh, lab test that he has received. And the tricky part is like all these community centers can send these samples to any laboratory in the entire country. So if you just, uh, so that is one issue. And then we also have uh, these issues about filtering and sorting based on the test result and whether the test has been approved. So we are talking about whether to use a track entity attribute or a data element, right? And again, uh, when, when we think about um, uh, a person, community person being able to send a sample to any laboratory, are we going to give access to the community person to entire country? So that's again a concern. And then of course, uh, uh, so, so, so all these, we had like uh, major discussions, how to cater this with DHIS2. And this is the approach that we took. So we decided to go ahead with this custom application, mainly to serve the requirement of this working list, uh, like a very custom view when they wanted approval and couple of other things to go, uh, which we captured as data elements. And then we use two programs. So we have one, uh, the community people enters data and we have another one for laboratory. And then like we had to have some granular access control at program stage level. So that we achieved by using sharing settings that we sometimes don't, uh, I mean, we, we, we sometimes uh, don't uh, think about this uh, having sharing settings as program uh, stage level, but it was really helpful for us to de design this. And then, of course, there's this concept that we uh, usually don't use called breaking the glass. So that's how we achieve this granular visibility. Like we only see the data that is only relevant to us. This we, we were able to achieve by using breaking the glass. And then there is another uh, concept that goes with the breaking the glass called over ownership override. So we use this, uh, of course, somewhat advanced uh, tracker concepts to configure this program and to achieve our uh, the expected visualization and the information requirement of the stakeholders. And of course, like what you are seeing here is this uh, breaking the gas concept that you can uh, configure when you are uh, uh, initially setting up your program, right? We can, we, we what we did was we uh, set the access level to the protector. Uh, at user level, we had to think about how we are, what is going to be the capture and the search org unit, because all these also have some implication on what data we are able to see, right? So with this, of course, like we were able to like, this is the wave uh, that the community people see um, initially. And then this is uh, the screen that, that uh, the hospital is able to see, of course, with the approval and uh, uh, the test results, sorting, everything is possible. So one reason we had to go for this custom application, mostly for to have this uh, working list and also to have this multiple API calls uh, pushed uh, in a single click that the end user does. Right. Uh, the next one is of course uh, the ICU bed management requirement. So this is a very simple requirement from the end user's perspective. They wanted to know 
how many ICU beds are available in the country and what is the uh, hospital user, hospital ICU person wants to know what is the nearest ICU bed uh, available for me to transfer my patient in case uh, we don't have uh, sufficient ICU beds. And from the national level, they wanted to know the daily status of how many patients are on high flow oxygen so that they can have an idea about uh, the resource uh, requirements which are needed to manage this critically Ill, uh, Ill, Ill patients. One major concern we had from the feedback when we were doing the requirement analysis was that the ICU people, it was very difficult to uh, do a proper training for them. So they wanted something very, very basic without uh, much confusion in the user interface, right? And then of course, they wanted this separate analytics for ICU beds and the daily status of the patients. So to do that again, mainly because they wanted this simple interface, we had to go for a custom application. Again, we went with two programs one for ICU beds, one for uh, the patients, and track entity types also were different, like one entity type was the ICU beds, basically, and the other one was the patient. So it's the same patient I mentioned to you before, like we have the same patient with different uh, program attributes that we are using across different programs. So of course, we went for incremental development. Initially, we just uh, made a, a small basic application to display whether the ICU bed is occupied, reserved, uh, or, or, or uh, is available. But then, of course, they wanted to capture this daily status of patients to get the resource requirements. So to do that, we had to uh, kind of like one stage. We, uh, I mean, our program, the tracker program for patient, it had a couple of stages, like stages, admission, daily status, and the discharge or the outcome. So there, of course, the daily status, we just redirected them to the tracker capture because like that was kind of changing all the time. So that's, again, one consideration you can do. Like if your requirements keep on changing, better to go with the, the standard DHS2 applications. And then, of course, they had this advanced uh, program indicators that, that had to be created. For example, we have an enrollment date by default when capturing program indicators um, and the analysis when, when we are configuring. So, for example, in some of these, we had to configure uh, based on this uh, the concept called this period boundaries where we have, we can, I mean, rather than going with the uh, enrollment date, we can use the event date. Say, for example, if we have an ICU patient who was admitted or enrolled a couple of days back, but the indicator that we want to know is based on uh, today's situation. Like, so that's the latest event of a particular program stage. We can use this event date, uh, event date uh, uh, instead of the enrollment date and have the enrollment analysis. So these kind of considerations we had to do while configuring uh, this uh, tracker program. So this is what we did for ICU bed. So as I mentioned, it's just a matter of clicking uh, the, uh, the status and the color changes. And of course, uh, uh, we also include another interface for entering data. All right, so the final uh, use case that I want to discuss is uh, of course, um, the immunization, COVID immunization uh, uh, tracker that we designed. So the thing is like, it's a, um, it's like, it's the largest tracker that we have implemented in Sri Lanka. Uh, why I say so is we have the entire adult population, which is 16 million enrolled into this uh, program, right? So that means like everything that we are going to do with the tracker or the DHS to instance is going to be difficult because it's a very large database that we are handling every time. So few major concerns was the pre-populated large track number of track entity instances, enrollments, and of course, the number of attributes, right, we had in the instance. And of course, in on top of that, they wanted to have real-time analytics available. So they wanted to know how many vaccines have been given today, as of now, I mean, as per this hour. So for this thing, we had to get real-time analytics enabled, right? So to do that, we had to enable real-time analytics by, uh, we have a, a new feature from last couple of versions called continuous analytics. We enabled it, but then again, one issue is like you always have to keep in mind the continuous analytics currently does not involve enrollment beta based analytics. So in case if you want to get uh, design some dashboards uh, based on real time data, then you have to know that whatever that is there as con configured as the attributes, uh, we cannot get a real time output, right? So we have to move them to uh, data elements in that case. So there we had to be very mindful about how we are using the attributes and data elements. So that was one major thing, and then. Like how ambitious we are, of course, I mean, it's not we, sometimes it's beyond our cons uh, control, how ambitious the ministries are in getting some uh, analytic output. So in small trackers, we don't feel that, uh, I mean, even if you want to get 
uh, number of vaccines given in last, I mean, say from the beginning of the pandemic, like one and a half uh, years. It's a major issue. But you can see here, this is from our glow root monitoring instance. Like when we try to get this particular analytic output or this dashboard item loaded, you can see it took 150 seconds, right? So that particular person who opened that dashboard had to wait. It's around two and a half minutes for this dashboard item to load. So this is because we are trying to get like a very large, uh, I mean, analytic output. We, are, we may not re actually realize, but the DHS2 has to process, do a lot of processing. So this again is something that you have to be mindful when you are signing your dashboards. So I guess I can stop here. So these are the insights that we have uh, from the implementation around COVID-19 uh, about how to uh, configure DHIS2 based on the uh, analysis and the information requirements. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Pamod, for this uh, very detailed and insightful presentation. I am aware that we uh, uh, screen here. So we have a, uh, a few other uh, questions to go through just to wrap up our discussion on analytics. And by the way, if you have any questions for Pramod on his presentation, please just leave them in the Academy Slack. Um, the, so about this question of um, comparing your tracker analytics and your aggregate data, um, this was actually a research question for the Palestinian National Institute of Public Health when they deployed their antenatal care and MCH e-registry, which was um, a point of care tracker system. So um, all public health facilities in West Bank um, were, and were using DHIS2 tracker for I think about the last uh, five years um, to enter in uh, pregnancy uh, profile data. Um, and then a research question at, compared this with the national HMIS. And I think it's um, quite instructive for future um, tracker rollouts because what you actually find is that the, the data on things like uh, maternal conditions or timely attendance, um, these were very different in the e-registry tracker system than in the routine health information systems. Um, and so it, as Kim mentioned, this is a paradigm shift, right? But you might also have some type of uh, discontinuity with your, uh, your regular data from aggregate reports. And it may cause a little bit of a pause or cause for concern or maybe some um, distrusting of the, the tracker data. Um, but it's really important to sort of um, dig into why these uh, results may be uh, very different. So you can see um, the mis uh, anemia was misdiagnosed um, quite a few times. Um, same with uh, very important conditions like preeclampsia or malpresentation at term. Um, and so either of these were being, um, uh, we had some issues with uh, counting diagnoses instead of individuals or misdiagnoses. So it's important to um, really find where the discrepancies are as you're rolling out the tracker to see if it's a data quality issue with your aggregate system or your tracker system. That's very important, especially if you're trying to integrate uh, aggregate and tracker. Um, this is a lot to go through, um, but so I won't get into all of it, but when you're mapping your tracker data and your aggregate HMIS, uh, we have a session, full session on linking aggregate coming next week to go into this in more detail. Um, but it's important to really keep in mind how you will align your indicator definitions between tracker data and the aggregate HMIS. Uh, one of the most important considerations is whether you are counting uh, events or um, encounters with the client whether you're counting enrollments or that is the individual cases. So you might think of uh, a case as like a pregnancy that has multiple visits. And then a, um, a tracked entity instance, which is like, um, just like a, the actual individuals themselves or the patients. Um, but there are a number of other questions to consider like how you're going to handle referrals or transfers in your indicators, if you're calculating incidents or cumulative incidents. Um, and then also about certain types of uh, skip logics you might need in your tracker um, or data validations, and then also what types of disaggregations. So this is just a number of questions that you may need to be considering as you're designing your tracker system so that you can ensure that the final tracker data are actually uh, linked well with the aggregate HMIS. Um, so some key takeaways just from the last session before we'll move on to Android. Uh, before building your program, it's important to write down the expected data outputs 
um, because this might actually impact the um, analytics options for routine statistics, as we saw with um, Oswald and Pomo's uh, discussion. Um, and this was a question earlier on the Slack as well, but um, um, I don't want to say that you need to try to include um, everything in, uh, that you might uh, want to have in your tracker system, um, but it's very important to balance a smooth data entry workflow and also the downstream information needs that your program will have. So finding a nice middle ground there that where the end users are not overburdened, but you're still gathering all of the data that you need for your, um, your m and &E and your uh, routine reports. Um, it's very important to consult with your national strategy guidelines and a broad stakeholder group to actually uh, ensure that you're capturing all the data in tracker that you need for this new model of uh, capturing data. Uh, but it's especially important to consider the routine information needs of the, the frontline users of the system to make sure they're getting the data that they need um, and see if you should maybe be increasing the frequency of data, um, but always important to um, be specific with what these indicators are measuring and be prepared for the, the possibility that because the data are being collected in a different way, they're not going to align perfectly with the aggregate system. So that might be a risk for your um, for confidence in the system down the road of your tracker. Um, so next steps to consider for your project, and maybe this is something you can think about um, later on in the day, but which indicators are most important to my project? And maybe come up with a list by user profile. Um, so whether you're MOH, an ME manager, or a care provider, and then rank your top indicators and really go into them in detail, like what you actually mean by this indicator. Um, and then uh, think about how can Tracker deliver some key performance metrics to the, uh, the end users or frontline workers. Maybe a, um, a dashboard might be too detailed, but a, a message or a routine meeting with uh, the care providers would be another way to do it. Um, and when you're thinking about what key decisions will be made based on your data, this is the very first part of that project planning template that Anna showed earlier. Um, so think about what is the objective uh, what systems will this replace and who is asking for the system. And I really think that the key decisions that will be made based on tracker data should be at the forefront of uh, those questions as well, so that you can make sure that you're planning uh, to use the indicators that are produced by your tracker. Um, and with that, I think that was all that I had. Um, and we can move now to um, Android and Hyman. We're set up because I've put my tablet there. So if I look at one point like this, it's uh, trying to work it out because I'm not sure. You should be able to see it, right? Yes. All right, good. Oops. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Uh, Sorry, Raimi, it's not in presenter mode though. What did you? Ah, okay. So you see the. Um, so I need Your to make it first. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, then I. Okay. Well. Um... All right. So thank you, everyone, for being here. I am going to be presenting Android for DHIS2. And the subtitle or the title of this session could be DHIS2 Goes Mobile and Offline. And as you can see, it says part one, because we have decided to split this session in two of them. One is going to be taking place now for an hour, and the other one has been scheduled for Monday. Uh, I think there's a lot of content. Uh, there are some questions that might rise up during this session that I think I'll be answering in the second one. So if that's the case, I might push the questions for that session, and I will try to prioritize the questions for this session. Um, we will have this last uh, 10 minutes for questions. So please uh, wait until then. I usually like interacting much more between you guys and me, but well, given the global pandemic, this is the way it is. Just a quick introduction of myself. I'm Jaime. Some of you know me already from other academies. Some of you know me from the community. I hope one day we can meet in person, hopefully soon. But I'm part of the Android team in Oslo and well, I'm happy to see you all guys here. So the sessions have been divided into two, a set session one, session two. In this one, what I'm going to try to do is present what is the application, 
I will try to talk briefly about some use cases. Then I will go a bit more deeply on to the application, what it can do for you, what uh, are the main features, let's say. And then I, once I have explained this, I will try to demonstrate or I will try to tri trigger something in your minds for you to understand why would you like to use Android in a tracker implementation, trying to provide some information. And then briefly, we will cover some considerations from both parts on the server side and on the Android. Again, there's gonna be a lot of information. Uh, do not hesitate to raise to rise up questions on Slack that I'm not watching now, but I will later on, or on the community. And then the last 10, 20, 15 minutes, we need to see, depending on how, how we allocate the time, we will have um, Pamot again, talking about some of their, um, Android um, issues or considerations they took into when, when deploying uh, Android in, in some places in Sri Lanka. And if we have the time, we might do a little demo or game that I will present. So let's get started. Um, quickly, what is the Android application? As you can see here, I've tried to separate diagonally and you will see in the upper left corner, it says UIO devs. So basically is because what I wanted you to try to understand is that the Android application that you see down there at the bottom, it's part of the UIO, but does not mean that all the applications are part of the UIO. So the way DHIS2 works is we have a server that provides an API, what we can interact with. And this, the main, that the Android uh, SDK is doing. So Android SDK talks to the DHIS2 API, and then the DHIS2 application is built on top of this DHIS2 Android SDK. Just for you to know that some community applications might be developed and they can interact directly with the DHIS2 API, or maybe they could even use the DHIS2 Android SDK. This is something that is explained uh, deeply during the Developers Academy. And I'm just putting it here in case there are developers in the room. I was very um, gladly surprised last year in Ghana when someone from the audience was a developer and we, we got to know a little bit um, more into each other and he explained me some stuff that he has developed. Uh, and just mention it here because in case you are um, curious about this, please do not hesitate to reach on Slack or on community and we can explain a bit further. But basically here we are today to talk about this, the DHIS2 Android application that interacts uh, with the server. So I don't know uh, if we would be live, I would ask a question, I would ask you to raise your hand, but I cannot see any of you now. But I would like to know who of you already knows about Android, the Android application. Uh, I hope most of you do. If you do not, don't worry. It's uh, I'm gonna be trying to cover pretty much everything now, uh, briefly. But uh, I would advise you to go to the website there, details to or Android, um, and then you or you go to features in the main site and the mobile data entry, because there is a video that covers a lot. There is a different uh features covered by by release version so i think it's pretty well explained i'm gonna be talking about it but uh, anyway if you need to share this later with someone uh, please go to the website i think it's quite complete and um, might be very useful for you to understand what's what's going on with Android. uh last thing before getting deeper into the application where to get the application i well some of you have been interacting already with the server, probably a system administrator has set up the server for you. But now if you want to, I'm sorry, this is popping up. I don't know if I can stop it, uh, but well. Um, so where can you get the application? Uh, there are several ways to get it. The last one, it's your own store. This, I'm not gonna be talking about it now. I will cover it in the next session, but basically you could get the application going to Google Play. If you look up for DHIS2 or DHIS2 Capture, you will see the application. You might still see some legacy applications or you can see some applications developed by other his or by other people, as I was explained before. Uh, but basically this is the official one. And you can also get it from GitHub. 
GitHub is the repository where we code the application. It's fully open source, as you know, the same as the, as the backend. And here, I just wanted to mention that if you would go to GitHub, you will find three versions. Production, which is the same one that goes, gets published on the Google Play. Training and SMS. Uh, training, I'm putting there in bold because I wanted to let you know that in case we do the demo, you're going to be seeing my DHIS2 training application. The training application allows you to do some stuff that you cannot do with the, with the production one. And for me, it's very useful because it allows me to, to troubleshoot much better. So at one point, if you're going to be implemented Android, probably you will be installing the training when you are doing all the tests, and then you will pass to the production. And the SMS is still listed here because we have some, some issues with, um, with Google in the sense that the application, because it can be used to send SMSs that we'll see later on, uh, you might need to publish in a different way. So nothing. just focus on production and training mainly. Uh, quickly, the features we have. Uh, this has changed since I was uh, having this lecture last session, more than lecture, last week in Ghana. Uh, but I'm happy to announce that now this is kind of what the application could look like. It might be the perfect companion for your products because it can allow you to, you to enter aggregate data entry. It has full tracker support and it has recently uh, been added with local TI analytics. A little remark here, sometimes I will be saying T-I, T-I, I'm sorry, I drag the Spanish thing. So when I say T-I, T-I, I'm referring to this, okay? In case I say it, because I think it will pop up during the, during the session. Um, but because we're in the uh, Tracker Academy, we're gonna be focusing mainly on this, okay? If there are questions about the other two, we can discuss uh, in the other channels. So, let me show you the application. I'm not going to have the live. We will do maybe at the end, but I have been taking some screenshots where I cover mainly the, um, the main features that could be useful for your tracker projects. So when you would open up the application that you have downloaded either for Google Play, as I've explained before, or from GitHub, this is the on the left side, you will see the main screen where you will have to provide the URL of the server. Uh, your username and your password. Uh, just for you to know that the URL could be used with a QR code. We will see at the very end. Uh, and once you log in, what you will see is this thing on the right. Probably you will not be seeing this thing on the right because this is an example and contains a lot of information. Probably you will be limiting the information that reaches your devices, as we will explain later on. But uh, I need to do something like this where you can see a lot of things. Because what I wanted to prove is that what we try to do from Android is we know we are aware that we are talking about a small device and we need to put as much information as possible in a nice visual way. So if we could go through every little detail in this application, in this screen, I think it tells us a lot in a nice way. So for example, you can see that for each programs we can have icons and colors as you see pointing on the first one, um, that we could see what data types are we talking about. For example, here uh, we have events in green. So here we have the antenatal care visit, which is an event program. Uh, for aggregate, we will be having the purplish one. So we can see that it says data sets. And the one that we are interested most in is tracker program, so TI. And basically it's gonna tell us the tracked entity instances we are targeting here. So in this case, person, but could be other stuff. So in case would not be showing person, but foci, malaria, um, uh, tracked entity, uh, vaccines, whatever. Just for you to know, and I wanted to mention it here that whenever we are using a tracker program, we're gonna be seeing here that, okay. On top of that, we can see what's the status of our programs or of our uh, yeah, um, aggregated, uh, so our data sets. So for example, here in this mark, we try to see that, uh, we can see that this ART monthly summary has not been synchronized because we see this little icon. 
uh, in case we're talking about events or tracked programs, we can, sorry about tracked programs, we can see what's going on with our um, events. So for example, we have overdue events. It helps us recognize and quickly jump into the program where we want. And also we could do some filtering that is here that we cover a bit later. So again, just trying to prove that Android tries to put as much information as possible in a nice visual way for those who have to enter or analyze the data. When we are covering a program, so can the tracker pro, track program, uh, we are going to define some things that we will reflect it on the devices. So I'm going to try to make a difference between the left side and the right side, and I will explain why later on. Uh, I don't have my, my speaker notes. <laughs> I should be able to see here as well. Uh, basically, what I wanted to mention here is that when you set up something on the server, uh, this will uh, will reach your devices. And what you can do is for specific programs, you can define which attributes you want to be searchable. And this is what Android will later on populate the same way, nothing new compared to the web version. But what you have is this playing list. And here, because we have a limited amount of space that we could use, uh, what Android is going to do is going to take the first three attributes and will display them in line here. So in this list, whenever you perform a search, you will see those here. It does not have to be the same search on this playing list, but the playing list is all the cards of the TIs that you will be seeing. Um, I'm saying three attributes, but it's not really true. It's three plus one, because in case you would have images as a tracker entity uh, attribute, the first one will be display here, OK? And this is an example program, but probably in this one that we have been using for this academy, we are using COVID cover specifically. And this one on the right side is actually coming from the WH package. And you see that here we have many, much more information. And when the car displays, while well, the car displays only three of these attributes, you could click on the little arrow you see there and would pop up, pop out all this other information. On top of that, again, trying to provide more information here, we can see that there is an overdue uh, event for this entity uh, from the 31st of March. Okay. And still uh, on the program main screen, I would say, on the search and list, uh, it has been included recently, the navigation bar down there that allows you to switch. I'm going to go back on the slides. You can see it as well here, bottom part of the right side, allows you to switch between uh, list display or map display. So with the map display, what we try to do is provide visual information, like your located information, where you can zoom in, you can scroll down here the, um, on the carousel, what is called the carousel. Um, sorry, I'm getting this pop up with the people in there. Okay. Um, and then on top of that, on the maps, what you could also do is define layers, the same ways that you can do, I think, in the, in the server side, where you could have some different layers to, to map or to, to pin on the map different things like TI, the enrollment, or the data. So it's still there on the main screen of the program without entering. When you perform a search, I'm not going to cover all of them, but just to mention that there is a huge possibility of filtering and sorting. So again, we are trying to help up to help the person in putting or, or taking out information from the system with all this filtering that allows him or her to search, for example, with dates that were added yesterday or in the specific time in a specific or units, um, that the sync status is one of these ones. For example, imagine you have had errors while working on the field and you want to filter now to correct them or the same for SMS in case you have been syncing by SMS that we covered that later, don't worry. And uh, you want it to include more information, you can filter by, by that. Uh, or for the enrollment status or for event status. So all this is part of the main program uh, screen. And once we, we get into one of the TIs, this is what we're going to be seeing. So imagine here, I would click in Fiona, not the case, but I will click on this tracker entity instance that I have um, searched 
or filter or search and filter and sort it. I don't know if I mentioned that sorting here, but we can also sort uh, descending or ascending. But basically, once we get into the tracking instance, this is everything we're going to see. Again, a lot of information in a small screen, trying to provide as many details as possible without overwhelming the user. So we'll not go through absolutely everything, but just for you to know that up there, we could have access to all the different programs this entity has been enrolled or should, yeah, or has she been enrolled in one of the other one. There we could have uh, options regarding the program. We can see again, the first three attributes plus the picture, if that would be the case. We can see what's the status on, of the enrollment. We can see where the track identity was enrolled, uh, what time and which organization unit. We could see more details. We could share this, I will explain a bit later. And here are the program stages or the where we could add the events, refer, um, or schedule. And down here, again, something that came in the last version, I think, on the previous to the last, we have a navigation bar that is going to allow us to move from one to another thing. So for example, I think I'm covering it here. The second entry or tab on the navigation bar would take us to the local analytics, which might be very useful for, for the person doing the analysis. You can present here in different ways, you could present in bars, in a tabular way, or in plot lines. The other, the third, tab it's the relationship so we could click there and we could see the relationship from this di to another one that we could visualize either in a list or in a map as you can see here on the right and on the last one we can see notes so sorry to be a bit rated in this but trying to present as much information as possible in a properly or nicely display area and way to to scroll okay so I've been presenting all the application. This is things that you might already knew, but once you have seen this, what I would like you to, to convince, or I would like you to try to understand, or I'd like you to, to think about when you are doing an implementation is why do you think you could be using Android? What is Android giving me that I'm not, I cannot get from the, from the server version of the HIS2? And I've listed some things here. I am, I think I had there in my notes saying that what, I, what I'm gonna be explaining now, I'm not trying you to, I'm not trying to convince you to drop server, so web version for Android. What I would like you to understand is that Android is there and it offers you some possibilities that might be really interesting when you implement a project. So again, this is not a fight among different versions, it's just another possibility. So instead of being locked down in one box, we're offering you another box and ideally you can probably combine both of them. So when I try to explain this, um, well, I make this point, but I'm gonna be covering some points that might apply, might not apply. I'm not covering all of them. So I think Pamot later on might explain some of them, which might be listed here or might not. And maybe there are some of them that are not covered here that you might come up, come up with them in the future. So for me, one of the main things, one of the main strong assets of Android is that it's mobile. So uh, you're gonna be having a small device like I have here, or I have my tablet that you cannot see there that can be taken by the person who's entering data or person who's checking that data and can be taken to the very last mile, can be taken to the point of care. So if you have community workers that are going somewhere, instead of having papers, they could take the device um, and this device would, would have the information. This is difficult to do with a desktop, obviously, and it's it can be done with a laptop, but because we will see later on, might not be ideal. The fact that it's mobile and it's included in one of these devices uh, gives other possibilities that are not usually happening with the web version. One of them, for example, is the QR on barcode input. We know that in some projects, they use 
barcodes to enter data, lab tests, uh, COVID passports, etc. So if you could be using a desktop, probably you will need to add um, a barcode scanner or this kind of barcode guns that will could read the barcode. But this forces you to install some software on your on your uh, laptop or desktop and somehow set it up. While the fact that most of the devices, if not all of them, include a camera, allows you to uh, just click on one data element or attribute that has been defined as barcode or QR could make your camera to pop out. You could read as it says here, uh, and this field will be auto-populated. This works for barcodes and QR, and we know it's been already used in some projects. Another good strong thing that it has is that it's touch and graphical input, which can help some people with which are less skilled or with literacy issues. For example, as you can see here on the right uh, screenshot I took, we have tried to put well, different colors, but also some pictograms that could help someone if they would not know what a microscope is, but they could relate because of the pictogram. Might help people that have lack of language skills or translation skills by being able to just click on the on the on the screen button, let's say, or the screen area, sorry, uh, you could input it. So this is something that it's really useful. Also, people are really used to use phones, so we believe it's it's quite easy to enter. Uh, the fact that it's a battery powered device makes you capable of taking it with you is just a small device, but also usually the batteries will be lasting much more for these things than in laptops. And uh, desktop, obviously you cannot take with you. So again, trying to, to reinforce here the mobile fact. Another strong point that we cover a bit later on is connectivity. Uh, most of the Android devices include by default a SIM card. I mean, this means they have 3G, 4G, or well, maybe 2G capabilities, but also SMS. Tablets in some cases might not be because they do not include this connectivity. Probably they will have Wi-Fi, so still could work in terms of you can move with it. You don't need a cable anymore. And when we're talking about community work, for example, or you go out there on the field, this can be really useful because you have your phone, you have there everything you need as we'll be seeing in the next section, but you take it with you, no need to have cables, no need to have connectivity. If you have, great. If not, you can always sync later on, as we see later, but uh, that's it. You take the ISU with you, that's it. And also offline, I'm covering this a bit later, I think, in, the, in two slides. If not, I will go back to it because I think for me, it's also one of the strongest assets. So in terms of cost, I'm not sure if you have had already the budget um, session or it's coming soon, but when you decide to use Android on your projects, it's going to have a big impact in your budget. And I'm not saying it's always going to be on the bad way because somehow it could also be on the good way. And here I'm trying to put some examples, but I think it could somehow reduce your infrastructure, infrastructure costs on some cases. For example, if you would need to provide uh, facilities with devices to enter data on your tracker program, uh, you might be buying desktops or laptops. If they are ready, it's fine. If they're not, you have to, to procure them. And sometimes you will find that these devices are cheaper. Uh, for example, I know some projects like in Gambia, they have decided to use Chromebooks. For those who are not aware, Chromebook is like a laptop, a bit cheap, but runs Android. So they are using the DHS2 Android application on them because they wanted to have a keyboard and they didn't want to buy tablets and on top of that keyboards. So by having the, the Chromebooks, they had everything, the best from the both sides. They have like a kind of keyboard, laptop, but running Android. In some other scenarios, I think this already present in some, oh, sorry, in some projects where they have allowed health workers to use their own device 
this BYOD means bring your own device. So somehow you don't need to procure, even though these have some security, will have some security risks that I will comment on in the next session. But you could be using devices that most of us already have. I think everyone almost nowadays has a smartphone. So we could be using uh, the Android application to access the SS2 on their on their device. They will just need to be facilitated the username and password, and they could be using it. And also, I think in some logistic cases, you could uh, enjoy uh, discounted infrastructure costs because in terms of power supply, you might have power banks that can, you can take with you that it's impossible to do with laptops or desktops. In terms of connectivity, the fact that these devices already have the connectivity, you don't need to procure Wi-Fi access points or you don't need to provide USB modems, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera. Uh, and the offline one. For me, I think this is the highest highlight of Android because connectivity is a challenge in many implementations. I come from working at another NGO when I know this is a fact. In many places, you will be lacking connectivity. And this would make impossible for you to work from a device that requires to be connected the whole time as it is with the web version. So the strong thing of strong feature of Android is that Android allows you to work completely offline. This has its advantages and its drawbacks, as we will explain in the next session. But basically, what Android does is try to acquire all the information that my use when they are offline. So let's say you have a community worker that is going to an isolated village where there's no absolute, where there's absolute zero connectivity. So he or she will go there and could perform all the work without needing to have 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, SMS connectivity. He or she can work on the device and then whenever he goes or she goes back to the town, he could put that information. Uh, that's the reason I'm putting the Braille connectivity or fully offline because also if at one point you will be implementing a product tracker project where there's absolutely zero connectivity, you could say, okay, the person could work for a month or two months, whatever period is required, and then could come back to a place where they have some connection, or even fully offline in the sense that the application has capabilities to transfer information, even though it's not ideal by QR codes. But you could also find that situation where an isolated phone could somehow sync the server via another phone. And also SMS sync, I know that some places cannot have or do not have 3G or 4G. So Android application is still would allow you to synchronize via SMS. I know that some Ministry of Health in Africa has have reached an agreement with uh, telecom operators for them to be able to sync things free of charge, SMS, sorry, free of charge. So I think it's also something that it's really interesting, even though SMS when using aggregate will not send as many SMSs. And when you're using tracker, maybe for the synchronization of a tracker entity instance, you might need four to up to eight SMSs. So I think it's not ideal, but I think it's worth also mentioning that there is also a possibility. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, so I've been talking about the application, why you might want to implement Android. Um, and now let's say I might, might have convinced you and you say, okay, I think it could work on my project. What should I take into account if I decide to do this? So of course, this slide does not cover absolutely anything. It goes some minimal part. But there are things that I want to mention here because I think it's really important for you to know and to consider whenever you decide to do an Android implementation for a tracker program, because there are things that you must do both sides, on the server side or on the client side. So if I go to the, to the server side, the, one of the main things you should consider, well, first of all, you should know that whenever you implement an Android project, you need to make changes on your, on, your, on your server. Most, I mean, I would say 99% of the cases because your 
the specific setup is not fully adapted for Android devices. And these are one of the main things. Again, there are more, but for example, the sharing settings, I've been telling you that the way Android works is the device tries to download all the information that it might use in the future when being offline. So the device will take and will tell the server, okay, give me everything I might use in the later uh, data entry stage. If you have not set this properly for the web version, does not matter because when you connect with your with your computer, you work, but you don't pre-cache all this information. With Android, is the opposite. Android takes everything. So if you would have not set this properly, the device is going to download a lot of information that will not be used. And this, you could see a problem from maybe the security perspective, but also it's a problem from resources in the sense that you're going to be downloading a lot of information. So this affects your internet connectivity, but also could affect your server in the sense that if you have one device downloading a lot of information, could be okay. If you have thousands of devices requesting all this information continuously to the server, you might kill the server somehow. This is something that we explain in the next session, which is called the syncing strategy. And it's something you have to think of. So the sharing settings need to be usefully adapted from web version to Android version. Ideally, when you reach the Android version, uh, will also work for web and will be more optimized in that sense. For the visual configuration, the same. If you remember, I was showing you on the right side at one point the microscope, the RD test, etc. Uh, this is things you need to work on. Probably this will also trigger if you have people that are not very well educated and they might need to have um, a specific training. You could work with colors, you could work with different pictograms. So all this is not there by default. It's something you need to work on. I am not sure this is available on web, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so this is something that you need to build on top of what you have. Everything is there, but you can reach this beautiful configuration in a linear entry or a matrix entry with colors, pictograms, et cetera, which I think might be really useful, again, for people who might not be uh, very literate or they might have some translation skills. So by using colors and pictograms, you could really improve the data quality. Somehow. So this is something we have, we achieved through the visual configuration and it's something you need to work on. If we talk about auto-generated values, I know many, many programs, Rocket programs, they use unique identifiers, which are generated automatically by the system. And here I'm gonna try to explain, explain somehow for you to understand because some people have already found it a bit surprising. But if we roll back like, five minutes when I was trying to explain you that Androids are gonna download everything they need to perform their tasks in the future. As an example, imagine that you have decided to have a unique identifier for a set of patients that work from the zero to the 1000. And you're gonna have 10 workers collecting this information. So whenever you could set up your program, you could expect to have from zero to the patient 1000, somehow in line. So first time, first patient you enter is the 001, the one, uh, 002, et cetera, to the, to the 1000. Uh, because Android devices cannot know how many patients you will be included uh, beforehand, what Android devices are gonna do, the application is gonna do, is gonna say, it's gonna tell the server, okay, give me a number of these identifiers that I might use or I might not use. So again, when we have 10 devices, so the first one is gonna to request to the server 100, the second one another 100, et cetera, et cetera. This means that at one point I might have in the server because the first worker goes on the field and registers 20 patients. So he's gonna register from the 0001 to the 0021. And then he synchronizes or synchronizes towards the server. And then the second page, the second worker is gonna register from the hundred 
to the 120. So at one point in my server, I could have these gaps. And this, I think it's important for you to know, not specifically this case, but just for you to understand how Android is working. It's Android pre-catches everything and then syncs to the server. And this can lead to these kind of gaps or discrepancies that you could not see in a web version only implementation, but it reaches with Android. So somehow might trigger different complexity when setting the system. I hope this was clear. Um, and then program rules, and I'm very sorry for this because it's one of recurrent topics in the community or in different support channels. Some people set program rules on their server, they work on the web version, and then they say it does not work on Android. I'm sorry to tell you it's absolutely true, it happens. And it is because uh, the web version and the Android version, they are using different program rule evaluators. And I know not, it should not be the case, and we are working on it. And at one point they are gonna merge. So you will not have these discrepancies. But at the moment, at the current time, whenever you set up something on your server, might work in one thing, in one version. So web version, and might not work in Android. So this forces you to make a uh, test and test and test. Okay. On the client side, so we have been talking on the server, the things you would need to do on the server. Now, when you have decided to implement Android, the thing you need to do on the client side is that you need to make sure that devices you're gonna procure to your workers, they are complying with what we have called the device specifications that I have linked here, and I will link after, also afterwards. Uh, unfortunately, it is important, impossible for us to tell you this will work, this will not work, because it really, really depends on each implementation. If your program is full of program rules, is full of pictograms, is full of a lot of information, you might need a more powerful device. And if your program is very simple, you might be able to do it with a very cheap or not so powerful device. This is the same way that for servers, I think there's another session talking about this. We give somehow guidelines, but it is impossible to tell this yes, this no. So what we usually recommend in that sense is that you could acquire a small set of devices, you test them, and once you're sure they do work as you expect, you will buy the rest of the devices. It can be challenging. It's also, it also could be very bad that you decide to move to Android or to, to put into place Android, and then in the end, the workers decide not to use them because they're very slow or because they don't work or because you have provided them with the small screens like this and what they need is to enter a lot of tests. So they wanted to have a keyboard, etc. So that's what I'm saying here, the type of devices. I think you need to understand your worker requirements for you to analyze and say, okay, now I have these device specifications. I have tested that it works with this device and I know that my workers need this, this and this. So with these things into mind, you should be able to acquire the proper device. And again, we usually recommend start small and then scale up. Also for the bring your own device, what I mentioned before, at one point you might find yourself using or implementing projects where you do not have the time as it might be for COVID, I think in some places, I think in, in Uganda, if I'm not mistaken, they told the users, please use your phone. So the, the workers were given a username and password and they could use their own device. So might not be ideal from many points of view, but somehow you could use them uh, for a quick deployment process. I know there has been a lot of information here. You might have grasped some of it, you might have not. Uh, so what I wanted to tell you is that we have most of this information shown or explained here in these two guidelines we have included. They are both in the official documentation. One is the configuration, which explains a bit better how to what you should do, the changes on your server to, to achieve something on your devices. And the other one is the implementation guide. So I think both could be very helpful. You have the link there, but if you could go to docdhis2.org, you could also find them. And I think, yeah, so 
that's all for this session. What we have uh, in the next one is going to be this. So I will cover in all the things that I've been saying. This, I will explain this, I will explain. It will be explained here. So now we are going to have some Q&A. But I think because Pamot should be ready, I don't see the stream. I will check now. But I think what we could do now is have, instead of the Q&A, have Pamot. And then we can have the questions. Um, if he's not ready, we can take some questions. But just for you to know, if there are questions related to what I will be explaining on Monday, I will not answer them if you agree with me, because I think it makes no sense that I anticipate what is going to be coming. And if Pamor finishes before, oops, oh, yeah. So 